Welcome to Italics, television for the Italian American experience. I'm your host, Anthony Tamburri. A few days after the Columbus celebrations, Italics goes to the Columbus Citizens Foundation and sits down with its president, Christopher Loyacono, and its executive director, Lisa Ackerman. We discussed Columbus Citizens Foundation's major celebration of Italian culture, the Columbus Day Parade, and other events and activities that benefit many within our community. Welcome to Italics. Um, this is the first time that I'm doing this interview after the parade. We've always done it before and we always had to dance around, you know, this is before so we can't talk about next week, et cetera, et cetera. But here we are finally being able to really look at the parade and, and the success of it, which, which I think it was, and we'll get to that. But let's let our spectators know a little bit about the Columbus Citizen Foundation. I know that a lot of them probably are familiar with it, but the, the foundation does so many good things. Great, Anthony, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, so the foundation is uh, a, a storied organization uh, that whose mission is really to support the Italian culture, Italian heritage, and also to provide uh, charity, where we are a 501c3 charity, and we provide uh, scholarships to underprivileged children. So those, that's kind of our overall mission. And the organization also has a um, kind of a side organization, which is a, an old-fashioned private club. Uh, so we're dual, we're dual um, organization. So our members are, are members in both uh, the charity and a member of the club. And we are a New York State membership-based charity. Sorry to sound like an accountant. I'm an accountant. Um, <laughs> so I uh, have to talk about the legal aspect of this. So we're really in good hands now. We're in good hands. We're an accountant for the next uh, couple of years. <laughs> and so uh, our members are, are members of both entities. And, yeah. and with, with the, um, the membership and, and the collaboration that, that, that the, the club brings, we use that as a, as a launch point uh, for our charitable endeavors and we, we use that um, to foster unity amongst our membership and to, to leverage all of that to, to create lots of activities and to hopefully generate um, revenues, charitable revenues to pursue our, our endeavors. There are about 550, give or take, uh, a few, about 550 members, correct? We're a little lower. We have a number of members who are on leave of absence due to COVID, mm -hmm. uh, but we're hoping mm -hmm. that after, after this season, we're on a calendar year or so after this, um, this season now that the world seems to be coming back yeah. to normal, especially here in New York, we're hoping yeah. to, to get uh, many of those folks back yeah. in the fold. Yeah, and I would just add one thing in non-accountant words. <laughs> Uh, because I'm a, I'm a, you know, historian. So, right, you're, yeah. Um, but, um, I, but I would say the other element in, we, in what we do, so we do have the membership organization and we do have the charitable side. Mm -hmm. And I think from both sides, what we also want to do is really inspire people. Um, both Italian and Italian-American mm -hmm. culture have had profound effects on the development of the United States and Italian culture really is something that uh, has been a beacon across the globe and so what we also want to do is inspire people we have programs um, that non-members can come to as well and it's an opportunity to learn about it might be film or literature or um, something interesting going on here in new york city that pertains to the italian american community so we're always looking for ways to engage people yeah and the discussions on columbus that's Let's right be honest you know those are <laughs> they 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 sort of were animated back in 2017 and they continue, um, and I think those are important discussions for us to have, those conversations, right? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So let's get to the gala. It was, it was, um, it was a great event. Um, Saturday night I thought was really good, and two wonderful honorees. We had about 400 guests with us mm -hmm. on Saturday night. Um, enthusiasm was high, even with a smaller group, and I think people really enjoyed the remarks from Tom Galassano and Bill Amelio. Um, two beacons in the civic, philanthropic, and business world. Dance floor was full, yeah. and, uh, and then I, I think the only other thing I would add about the gala was, you know, a lot of times you think galas are the purview of uh, older people in the city, but we had um, 30 members from our Young Adults Auxiliary yeah. there, so it was fantastic um, to see amongst those 400 people a lot of very mm -hmm. young faces. And the proceeds, we should say, uh, the proceeds go to primarily, if not exclusively, scholarships, correct? 
Right. So, so uh, the net proceeds, because that's cost yeah. of running an event. Right. So those net right. proceeds go into our, our our general fund, and we use those funds uh, for all of our uh, you know um, uh, charitable endeavors, which also includes uh, supporting her uh, Italian heritage and culture. And Lisa talked about all the events that we run, and they support those events as well. So it's scholarship yeah. and all our other mission. And the parade was also uh, the parade seemed larger than than before. So there seemed to be more floats or, uh, than yeah. last year. There were more floats uh, than last yeah. year. Uh, you know, last year we were back on Fifth Avenue, For but the first there was time. still a lot of COVID restrictions last fall and a lot of uneasiness, I think. But um, this year, in fact, we had more floats uh, and some new floats. Uh, the Italian American Museum and the Museum of Chinese in America jointly sponsored a float, uh, which was a great way to talk about two immigrant communities in New York City that are now very intertwined, the way uh, both um, have shape-shifted over time and as development has happened in the city but there's still um, very much a sense of Chinatown and Little Italy even if they're a little intermingled. It felt like there were more participants, uh, more viewers this year. We had great weather yeah. and at some parts of, of Fifth Avenue they looked like they were five or six deep uh, yeah. on the sidewalk and that felt really great so there was really wonderful energy walking up Fifth Avenue uh, and I felt like the city really enjoyed uh, the parade. And so maybe a combination of great weather, finally, you know, post-COVID, people being able to come out and enjoy a parade again. And so I thought it was spectacular. So one, one of the other things that, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the tone, not the tone, the, yeah, I guess we can say the tone of, of just about all of the honorees that I've seen over the years are always those, and this is, I'm, this is positive for me, those who have pulled themselves up by their bootstraps, right? So this year, Golisano and um, Amelio uh, respond to that characterization, and that was really good to see, I think. Um, it's a very uh, uh, consistent theme, I yeah. think, of our Grand Marshals and honorees. Many of them uh, came from working class roots and uh, started businesses and, or rose up through the ranks in their companies. Uh, to become very, very successful. And so that hard work theme is very present uh, here at the foundation as well. Our membership very much reflects yeah. that profile. And I guess it's part of the, the, the Italian American story. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we do enjoy uh, the stories of those types of people. It's much more inspiring yeah. to say I had, you know, I was a trust fund baby and, and here, <laughs> I, here I am. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, let's go back to the scholarships because I think people don't realize how substantial they are. I know when I first became involved, you know, uh, with the Columbus Citizens Foundation, I had no idea how substantial they were. And, um, and that the students every year to keep that because it's a four-year scholarship and every year to keep it they've got to sit hand in their grades you know and things their 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 records are evaluated so yep ahead, sure so uh, the scholarship program started in 1984 so you know at a moment when um, financial aid was not as prevalent as it is today and but even with more robust financial aid at universities and colleges people still struggle uh, we all read the articles about how prohibitively expensive um, college can be. And so the scholarship program looks at uh, people's grades, um, their public service, um, their financial need, and um, we have very enthusiastic members who participate in the scholarship committees. So there's a vetting process that's robust, um, and you never can help everybody that you wish you could. And, uh, but even so, uh, we give out about $2 million a year in scholarships. And collectively, since the program began, we've uh, raised about $40 million and distributed uh, about $36, $37 million in scholarships. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then we're very, very fortunate that we have a number of uh, endowed scholarships so that many of these scholarships will continue on long into the future. They're basically high school and college? They're high school right? and college um, primarily. Uh -huh. I'd say, um, uh, you know, in any given year, we're probably giving out, um, you know, 30 to 35 new high school scholarships, 30 to 35 new uh, university scholarships, and then additionally, we have some special awards. We have two medical school awards, mm -hmm. um, one uh, that's for somebody going into the public health sector mm -hmm. named for Dr. Fauci, and another one sponsored by the Morgani Medical Society, uh, which is another philanthropic group devoted 
to the Italian American legacy. And uh, then we also have, um, thanks to uh, Frank Guarini, we have an endowed scholarship that allows somebody to go to John Cabot University. And uh, so they get to have an immersive experience in Rome. And we have a scholarship in the arts named for uh, Franco Zeffirelli. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, you know, so, and we're hoping to expand. One of the new programs that we have that will launch this year for the first time is we've raised some money to allow somebody to have at the college level an immersive experience in Italy that could be to study Italian language for the summer, could be to work on an archaeological dig in Italy, could be to go to an art school, anything that feels like they can connect to Italian culture um, and not have the financial burden of not working in the summer. Uh, mm. So we're very excited about this new opportunity that's being added to and our that'll offerings. be for one individual? Uh, well, we actually have raised enough money that we probably will be able to offer, uh, this first year we'll be able to offer three summer oh, awards. Wow. So yeah, we're very excited about yeah. that. And, um, and we're working with some other donors on some other similar possibilities mm -hmm. in addition to the four-year opportunities to have some shorter-term opportunities that allow somebody to do something that maybe their financial aid that's tied to tuition doesn't let them do. So the other thing I wanted to mention was um, the public, the, the programming, the cultural programming that's the last few years, let's say, I don't know, during COVID maybe. Right. Um, during COVID, there were, there, were, there were a significant number of events that took place on Zoom and was basically open to the public, as opposed to something being private just for the membership. But also now, even post-COVID, some, some of the programming is open to the public. They, they are. We're a traditional uh, public charity. Uh -huh. So while we have uh, a member base that are the most significant donors to our cause, um, nothing prohibits us from opening the doors and allowing the public to come to educational right. lectures. So there are some things that are still for members and donors only, but I think one of the reasons we've opened the programming more is that if we're holding a lecture, say, on um, the history of Italian-American depictions in film, um, which we did with you, uh, so I'm using that as an example. Um, it's great cross-pollination for us to say to you, you know, if there's people in the Calandra Institute community who would like to come to this event, um, you know, we've got the space and, um, and we really want to have a more open feel to a lot of the programs. And as we've brought in a lot of speakers, sometimes they have um, either students or former students or colleagues who really add to the discussion by having them in the room. So it's, it's an opportunity to expand our audience, but also if you've got great content, you want to share it. And yeah. so um, we really don't want it to feel like for a lecture or certain kinds of musical events, there's uh, no reason not to have a broader shared experience. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe somebody gets inspired and wants to learn more about yeah. Italy or Italian America or us. So it's a great opportunity. Yeah. In passing, it was mentioned that there were members of the Youth Auxiliary at the gala, for example. Talk about a little bit about the Youth Auxiliary um, and, and how those under a certain age can be can be members of, of the Columbus Foundation. Right, so we have a, a different class of membership for our, for our younger uh, folks. Uh, obviously, we're trying to sustain and perpetuate our organization, and that starts by bringing on young people. Of course, they bring great energy and, and new, new ideas to all, to all of us. We have some folks here who love doing things the same way year after year, uh, but the young people really um, uh, bring us a, a different vision. And so we encourage them, we, we offer a different structure for them in terms of membership and, and fees and charitable contributions for them to participate at a much more modest level. And we encourage them to get involved in all of our programs. So they're part of our, all of our committees now and they bring uh, new perspectives, which is actually terrific. And this year, uh, Lisa's done a great job incorporating them into these committees and we're now giving them positions of leadership on some of these committees because yeah. they are so uh, terrific. and. They have brought, uh, they've been able to successfully sell their ideas to existing members, which is just wonderful. So we're starting to see that transition, which is yeah. you know, something we want to foster. Mm -hmm. and, and just, uh, you know, in business and in, in organizations like this, you just need to continue to think about sustainability and, and perpetuating your, your mission. And mm -hmm. 
this is the way to do it. Yeah, yeah. The, I, you know, I think the elder states person is always, you know, a great resource, but shouldn't be the only resource. You know, it's good to get some young, some right. new and young ideas and sort of, sort of an animation that maybe the elder states person might right. have sort of yeah, and I, dropped I, by the wayside. And I think building <laughs> on that, we really want to be able to speak to all the varied members who are at different stages in their life. So the elder states people provide us with fantastic opportunities to understand the continuity of Columbus Citizens Foundation and its offerings. But mm -hmm. similarly, we've now embarked on a partnership with the Italian American Council on Education mm -hmm. to um, develop some children's programming. So we are going to have a series of programs with Simona Rodano, better known as La Fata Italiana. Right. Um, and she's going to do some immersive Saturday morning program with families. So it's an opportunity to learn Italian through games, folklore, song, dance, and um, have fun, I hope. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I think being able to offer something to some of the families here within the community is yeah. also important. Well, and, and a couple of months ago, maybe it was a month ago in September, um, there was the meeting with Yace, the language, the meeting on language, learning and language teaching, et cetera, that was, uh, I think, about 50 or 60 people present and a couple of hundred on Zoom. We did, right? we did. Yeah. We, uh, yeah. So that was another great partnership um, with Yace. And, um, and I learned two takeaways from that um, event we had here where we did have about 60 people on site and about 200 on Zoom from more than 20 countries across the globe. And I, I learned two fascinating things about teaching Italian worldwide. One was when you look at the amount of money other countries spend on the investment in teaching their language in other countries, um, Italy does not spend much money at all in comparison to many of these other countries, um, which is a real detriment, which means the philanthropic community needs to fill a big gap if we want to make sure that Italian is offered uh, across the globe, but here in the United States as well. Um, and then the other thing that I learned really was that an astonishing number of countries across the globe really still prioritize Italian as a language to be learned, um, to be considered a well-rounded mm -hmm. person. So you might want to study art history or theater or music, and Italian is still essential for um, many people studying that at the graduate and undergraduate level. Yeah. So, um, so it was, it was a very fun event, but it was also instructive. Yeah, good. You know, one of the things that people don't realize, and this is something that I only found out about 15 years ago, in spite of the fact that I've been in this profession for m many more than that, is that in the 1600s, because, you know, when there was still navigation, was still strong, Italy was still strong in navigation, that in certain parts of the world, Italian was the lingua franca for business, you know, and that was the language in which business was uh, conducted. And that was interesting to forget that. But I always say, you know, my, as, as, as a professor, trained as a professor of Italian, my always mantra is there'd be no Shakespeare without Petrarca, and there'd be no Petrarca without Dante, and there'd be no Dante without Quinita. I bring it back to the Sicilian School of Poetry, the 1200, <laughs> you know, it all begins there. Everything in Western, you know, all the Western civilization lit, you know, all begins in, <laughs> no, but really, yeah, the importance, I think, of, of Italian, of the language and also the culture is um, much greater than, than, than the credit it gets, I think. It, in, uh, and, we, and what's one of the things that we as Italian Americans have to be, um, conscious of and sort of push, you know, uh, how important Italian, yeah, Italian is. So, and, 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 and holding an event like that, I think is really important. It's really important. Yeah, no, I hope we do much more of that in the yeah. future. Um, and I think it's always surprising to people how pervasive Italian culture was, mm -hmm. um, even before explorers yeah. came to this hemisphere. But, you know, it's interesting when you start to think about um, how pervasive the Roman world was, which was one culture, but even Italian culture in the Middle Ages and in the Renaissance really was very far flung. I mean, there are uh, 14th and 15th century accounts of Italian monks, a lot of it was monks, but yeah. um, you know, traveling to the Middle East yeah. um, and writing these incredible chronicles of um, going to Palmyra, going to Babylon, and so some of our 
earliest accounts of archaeological sites in the Middle East, for instance, come from these Italian monks who were out there exploring the world. Um, Catherine the Great's um, architect was Restrelli, who was yeah. an Italian. And so if you start looking for it, Italian culture pops up in all yeah. kinds of places across the globe. And I think with our programming, that's what we really want to do yeah. is try and show people that in addition to the Italian American experience, there's this incredible world experience yeah. of Italian culture. And, and, and even a little bit more in your area uh, of the world, but even in banking, for example, the whole brand system, right, comes out of the Banca d'Italia by Amadeo Giannini in San Francisco at the beginning of the 20th century, you know, who then um, creates the Bank of America after having bought a little bank in LA that was something I had found out about only about 10, 12 years ago. So, um, yeah, even there, you know, Italians have made, have left their mark, you know, um, the indispensable mark, I think, on, on Amer United States, United States culture. So, what, uh, I'm assuming that the cultural programming is going to continue as it is, that is fervent, you know, significantly uh, enhanced from, what, six, seven, eight years ago, maybe, when, before the doors were sort of opened up mm -hmm. um, to non-members. Anything we should look forward, we should look forward to, keep our eyes and ears open. Um, you know, we're going to continue the programming. I think yeah. we look to our members always for great suggestions. Mm -hmm. of, um, if an event inspired them or made them realize something we're not talking about, um, we really want to have this be a program that speaks to everyone. So I think we'll continue with the lectures and the musical programs, the children's programming. We'll see how that yeah. goes. Um, we also have a lot of talented former scholarship recipients, so I've really started to reach out, um, as have other members of the staff. So for instance, last spring, one of the former scholarship recipients who's a science teacher in Brooklyn wrote a children's book about bugs. So we invited her, uh, insects probably, not bugs, yeah. that's my <laughs> word, um, but um, we invited her to come do a nature walk in Central Park with the students and do a little um, hands-on craft program with them. So we really want to do more things that engage the former scholarship recipients as well, because they're doing fascinating things and bringing them back only strengthens that sense of community. Mm -hmm. And so I hope that what you'll see more of in the years to come is more engagement with the scholarship recipients. And another yeah, a, a, a scholarship recipient, um, and I think he's probably around 26 or 27, if I remember correctly, I'm talking about six, eight months ago, present, wrote a book and presented. He, he did. Yeah. Um, so that's Vincenzo Guido, who's working for an organization called Thrive for Life, um, mm -hmm. which helps the formerly incarcerated. Um, get a leg up on finding jobs and housing yeah. and the skills they need to thrive. And um, he's working um, with a uh, Jesuit priest, um, Father Zach Prezuti, who founded the organization. And uh, he's, he actually just started law school, but he did. He extraordinarily, at, yeah. you know, at, at younger than 25, um, wrote and got a book published about, uh, you know, the possible reforms of the justice system. I think we don't realize how tough it is if you've been incarcerated, mm -hmm. how many doors are closed to you, and um, Father Zach and Thrive for Life yeah. are trying to turn that around for yeah. people. So it's yeah, great. we have people doing extraordinary things. It's wonderful, yeah. It was great, it was a great weekend. I'm assuming you're both very happy with the way it all went. We all were very pleased. We had two very engaged uh, honorees and, and Grand Marshal. Um, I thought the gala was terrific. I love the feel of Cipriani. Yeah. It's, a gr it's a wonderful venue. Um, and uh, as Lisa indicated, we had great energy in the room that night. The dance floor was full at the end of the night. I was a little concerned because it was kind of quiet during the dinner. <laughs> but uh, at the end of the night, everyone really perked up and began dancing. And it was a nice really finish to the, to yeah. the gala and a nice way to celebrate. I want to uh, thank you. First of all, congratulate you on a wonderful weekend because I know that you have wonderful staff that you depend on and you you know and they're great here um i want to also um thank you for taking time to to spend with us it's great our thank pleasure. you for having thank us thank you so much thanks for watching this episode of italics i'm anthony tamburri arrivederci alla prossima puntata